Developer experience has become a common topic within just about any tech circle, but what does it actually mean? I mean, it's something we talk about a lot and we use this word pretty ubiquitously, but does, do we understand what it actually means? I think it's easy to look around the world and assume that we've got it all figured out, that we've optimized every invention that humans have come up with. And we do this every day without thinking. We look at forks and toilets and shoes and never really question that they function as desired because for the most part, it works. These objects accomplish the tasks we set out for them, but it doesn't mean that they can't be improved. And that's what I'm interested in today. I think you would be hard pressed to find anyone listening to this who regularly walks into the airport with a suitcase that doesn't have wheels on it, just a bag. Wheeled suitcases have become the norm, the absolute default. Whether it's two wheels or four, anywhere you look at the airport, there are hundreds of people dragging their luggage behind or beside them. But that wasn't always the case. Up through the 70s, people were lugging massive suitcases around the airport without the help of wheels. I mean, just carrying it. <laughs> now, granted, air travel during that era had some real benefits, truly. The leg room enough, <laughs> alone was enough to tempt me to put up with the sheer fire hazard of dozens of lit cigarettes in air. Plus, you were fed, not three pretzels or a single peanut chucked at your face by a disgruntled flight attendant wearing duct tape as a bracelet, but a whole meal included in the price of the ticket, which is wild to me. It wasn't until 1972 that the first patent for a wheeled suitcase was granted by the United States, States Patent and Trademark Office. 1972. For those following along, we strapped three square-jawed Americans to a rocket filled with half a million gallons of fuel and sent them to the moon with a hope and a prayer before we could buy luggage with wheels. It's clear to me that evolution is not a straight line. As I said earlier, I'm Emily Freeman. I'm the author of DevOps for Dummies and the co-curator of 97 Things Every Cloud Engineer Should Know. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with you, and I'm really looking forward to the fireside chat after my talk. So please come up with questions and we'll chat after. It's really easy to just look around and to accept things for what they are. We've accepted that there are things that are easy and there are things that are hard. And when we come around and, and think about the constructs that humans have developed, it's easy to think, well, that's good enough. The suitcases of years past were also good enough. The truth is that suitcases didn't need to have wheels. It didn't actually improve the functionality of the suitcase, except it made it easier to manage. It made easier travel easier for us. Rather than carry a really heavy suitcase, we could just drag what we needed behind us. Wheeled luggage made a hard task easier. When it comes to tech in particular, we have a culture that takes pride in being able to do the hard things rather than making the hard things easier. Many of us are guilty of aligning our own self-worth with our ability to do the hard things. Now, developer experience can be viewed through many different lenses, but this perhaps is my favorite. It is an evolution of our skill set an abstraction of the fundamentally difficult things and an invitation for anyone to become a developer, no matter their background. Developer experience goes by many names. I've heard DevX and DX, whatever you happen to refer to it as, it definitely has become ubiquitous across our industry. And at a high level, we all understand that it's a certain measure of a developer's experience when utilizing certain tools to accomplish particular tasks. But I wanna go just deeper than that and dive into not only what makes great developer experience, but also why it matters. 
when we're talking about developer experience, there are two points of view. The first is internal DX. How delightful and straightforward is it for your team to develop your products and features? The second is external. This is when your product is developer focused. When your users are developers, UX is DX. Internal DX is really focused on productivity, whereas external DX is focused on usability. But I think they're pretty related. Developer joy isn't something that we often talk about, and I think that's a mistake. I care that developers enjoy their work because joy is the flame of creativity. I fundamentally believe that happy developers are more creative and more inventive. It's that creativity that fuels the future of our industry, the new inventions and iterations, and approaches and methodologies that take us forward. If we're not working collectively toward a better future, what exactly are we doing? Honestly, why even bother? I mean, money is the currency of our society. That's just a fact, one we can't deny. And money isn't just a medium through which we trade value. Money is how many of us measure our successes and how we compare ourselves to others. It's a societal stack ranking tool. But I think if most of us went just a little deeper than our basic need to provide for ourselves and our families, if we look deeper than our desire to feel secure, we'd find we need something more some mission, some North Star toward which we can journey, that elusive purpose we all seek in the quiet moments of our life, something that makes our living worthwhile, worth more than our limited time. I believe joy is the fuel of purpose, and without it, we will stagnate, holding in a pattern of the past indefinitely. Now for the capitalists in the audience, don't worry, I see you. <laughs> I like to think of investing in developer joy is a little like angel investing. When you invest in a pre-product, pre-revenue startup, sure, you're betting on the idea. But more than anything, you're betting on the founders, that they are capable of bringing this idea to fruition, that they can pull it off. And that investment won't pay dividends immediately. Angel investing is a long-term bet. Investing in developer experience just for the short-term win of developer productivity misses the point. You'll get a small win, but when you go big on developer experience, that bet, that early investment over two, five, 10 years will become the key differentiator between you and your competitors. You can see this in the market right now. When you invest in developer experience, you move faster, you ship more inventive products, your services are typically more stable, and you will earn the loyalty of your customers and often employees. Now, when it comes to selling developer tools, the survey conducted by Slash Data found that 92% of developer leaders are involved in purchase decisions. Developer experience isn't just something we want to do, it's good business. Great developer experience has four key characteristics. It is expected, consistent, quick, and intuitive. Expected behavior is fundamental to any product or tool. Does the product actually do what it claims to do? This starts with the basic question of accomplishing the task needed. A CI-CD tool on a very basic level should include source control, testing capabilities, and deployment features. In the cases where there are standards across the industry, does the product follow the standards or do they require learning a unique or proprietary approach? Finally, when you're thinking about expected behavior, if you asked a subset of developers, would they say that the product behaves as they would expect? That'll tell you. Consistency is more important than you think. I was in Berlin once at a Chris Kindlemach, and only I had gotten there late. 
and the shops were closing. They were shutting their little wooden doors and I was starving. I had been on a train all day. I hadn't eaten a lot except those snacks in the little snack car. And in that moment, all I wanted was to feel satiated, to feel something familiar. And then across the city skyline, I saw those golden arches. <laughs> and I swear, the moment I ate that first McDonald's French fry, it was an immediate feeling of home. Now, McDonald's isn't necessarily good food. It's certainly not good for you, but it is consistent. Across the globe, we know that that Coke and those fries are going to taste exactly the same. That is a powerful draw. Consistency can speak both to the stability of the product from a resiliency perspective. In other words, is the product usable most of the time? And from the perspective of the frequency of changes. Now you could have the best product in the world, but if you change your user interface or UI too frequently or keep shifting the primary call to action around the page, your users will hate it. Now that's not to say you can never change anything, but be cautious that the positive outcomes of any change far outweigh the cost of learning this new process or pathway. Develop developers can simultaneously be some of the most patient and impatient people I know. Now that's a contradiction, I'm aware. We'll call it the developer paradox. Yet it's true, I have never seen anyone with more patience and dedication when working through a difficult problem than a developer. They will literally sit there struggling for days, even weeks, just thinking, ruminating over the same problem until in a literal aha moment, they stumble upon the answer. But that's where the impatience kicks in because once they know what they need to do, it is a race toward the finish line. And if your product becomes the bottleneck, they will talk about how much they hate it and how much that product sucks forever, literally forever. <laughs> now the quickness is certainly secondary to the reliability and some things still take a bit of time. Don't thwart stability for speed, but optimize to provide the developer the fastest path forward. Finally, great developer experience is intuitive. Developers should be able to feel their way through the expected behavior. Buttons should be where they expect. Documentation should be easily accessed and in an obvious place. And the application should be easily searched and easily navigated. Think about your own user experience with various websites and applications. Password fields are my own personal hell when it comes to this. Character limitations, like what's up, eight characters? Are you kidding me? An inability to paste a password from a password manager, like I'm gonna sit there and type out all 26 characters. The random refreshing, it's endless. The list goes on and on. And even if you've never developed software yourself, you can start to imagine the frustrations of dealing with these endless, unintuitive interfaces and workflows. Start to explore how you interact with various applications from banking to email. Identify the shortcuts you take to avoid annoyances because we all do this. We all have different patterns in our behavior to overcome these limitations. Notice when something lags or displays a confusing error message. Now imagine how nice it would be for every experience to be intuitive, just as you expect. Creating great developer experience starts at the very beginning. While there are countless opportunities to improve your developer experience, there are a few I find separate those who excel in DX and those who don't quite nail it. Key architecture decisions ensure your ability to scale as your business grows while maintaining a strong DX. In the case of an external API, ensure you think through the additional endpoints, functionality, and parameters, and how those things can be added without overcomplicating the use of that API. Architectural choices that can be reverted or adjusted may be made quickly without fear of long-term consequence outside of cost, of course. But decisions that cannot be undone at all 
should be considered thoughtfully with an understanding of the consequences over that long term. It is very normal to get excited about all the possibilities and want to find ways to integrate every option into a launch. This becomes even more tempting if you have a suite of product, products or services. And while options in and of themselves are quite useful, being presented with every single possibility all at once is overwhelming and can trigger decision fatigue. Now, if you're not familiar, decision fatigue is a term popularized by John Tierney and theorizes that a human's decision-making becomes diminished as that human makes more and more decisions. This is the reasoning behind Steve Jobs wearing a black turtleneck and President Obama wearing the same style suit every day. Except that day he wore the tan suit and everyone lost their minds. <laughs> decision fatigue is very real. If you've ever felt hungry but couldn't quite decide what to eat, that's decision fatigue. You've experienced it. You want to create this happy path for developers to follow that gets them to a win, a small success, anything that provides a sense of accomplishment and showcases your product. That bit of dopamine will adhere a sense of interest and excitement to the product. Then start mapping how your current customers expand their service usage. I find very few com companies actually put the work into this. We often talk about adoption, that initial hook that draws customers in. Less frequently, do we discuss the average path a customer takes through a product suite? And once you have that data, it's extremely powerful. You can utilize it to extend that initial happy path you designed. Now, great design is something everyone can recognize, but few of us can accomplish despite our egos. You may think that backend developers don't care about design, and you're right in that they will never say they care about design. Many of them will defend monospace fonts with their life, but that doesn't mean they don't behave in a way that showcases how powerful design can be. Layouts, fonts, brands, readability, the use of blank space, these are all things that seem unimportant but can have massive impact on developer experience. Developers are not designers. Now, unfortunately, I'm not a designer either. I can't give you a ton of advice in this area, but I do know that you should hire one and pay them well, and that that investment will absolutely pay dividends over the long term. Documentation is often overlooked as a last minute addition to a product launch. But documentation makes or breaks product adoption, especially for developers. Stripe is famous for their documentation, and they were one of the first to take a different approach. Rather than list out every API and all the parameters that can be passed through, Stripe documents specific use cases. This means that a developer is presented with only the most pertinent information to get them started. Then, as their use case expands or they want to try different avenues, they can dive deeper into that documentation. Now, here's what I love even more. Every example in Stripe documentation includes a token that enables the developer to try the API using a curl request or a tool like Postman. And to access this, there's no login, there's no credit card required. Stripe has systematically removed every barrier that a developer would normally face when experimenting with a new product, service, or feature. They streamline that path of usage, plus enabling that product to speak for itself. We should all take a lesson from that and remove the barriers of adoption that exist in our own products. Now, measuring developer experience is tricky because you have to look at the whole. It's not something you can break apart and study in little pieces and then determine a score. But for me, the one key indicator of success in developer experience is how quickly someone is able to walk that initial happy path you laid out for them. My friend Scott Kate calls this MTTS or mean time to success. It's the time someone takes from the time they sign up or land on that first page to their first win. Now that win could be 
uploading an image or deploying a pipeline to a staging environment or completing that curl request. The win doesn't matter and it doesn't have to be big, but it does need to be a win that enables them to walk an entire path through your product or service. This strong path requires you to have an opinion of how your product should be used. And it's these strong conventions and defaults that enable great developer experience. Now that doesn't mean there aren't escapes from that path or other options for more advanced users, but the path existing is the cornerstone of your success. Pay deep attention to the feedback your customers give you and your internal developers when using these tools, especially those frequent pain points that come up and then fix it and do that again and again and again. <laughs> The truth is many of us can't see the ways in which we can improve the developer experience in our own products. We're simply too close to it. We have to rely on the feedback of our customers. It's easy to dream of going to the moon, of making these giant leaps forward, launching new products, inventing totally new ways of developing software. The moon landing was exciting, historical, important in its own way. But I think the more impactful changes are the ones that put wheels on suitcases, the changes that take a hard look at the everyday items and experiences and improves them. And when it comes to developer experience in particular, those are the changes that have the biggest impact, not just on developer joy, but also on your bottom line. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Emily. That was absolutely amazing. Um, you got an awful lot of love on the chat as it went along. Oh, thank so you. Really, really wonderful communication. Um, so I have a few questions. Um, the first one is that uh, you're, you're a rare breed that can go f from tech to being able to communicate so well. And one of the things that I see in the, in the conference business is that there are people who don't necessarily understand how to start, how to communicating outside of their work. So I, I love that as developers, we can create value with our hands. We can improve the world by what companies we choose to work with. And we get to actually make things with our fingers and our minds and our hearts that make the world better. And then what you do is you go out and you tell others about it and you inspire others to do it. So can you tell our audience a little bit about how to go about that and that they in fact can as well? Yes, yes. I believe strongly that we can all communicate and keep in mind, I was a writer before I was in tech. So I put 10 years into this. This isn't something that I just came out, um, I was born with and, and just popped into humanity with this skill set. I had to put time into it. Um, and interestingly, you can read about communication, but I actually learned the most uh, for myself from stand-up comedians. I think if you watch stand-up comedy and you don't just absorb the funny, <laughs> which it is funny, um, but you really look at how they pause their language, how they allow still moments to impact the, the feeling that they're trying to have the audience experience, how they move around the stage, how some of them use the, the microphone in a way. Wanda Sykes is particularly good at using the microphone as a sort of prop uh, to help tell her stories. And so I think when you kind of focus on absorbing how people who are successful at communication actually deliver that and breaking that apart. And developers are very good at breaking that apart, right? So break it into these little pieces. Uh, that will help for sure. I owe everyone a book. I'm, I'm writing on how to develop um, or how to, to give a conference talk. And so I'm way behind on that. Apologies, but I'm working on it. Um, so that'll come out soon. But yeah, just really focusing on you know, believing that you have a point of view and then leaning into that. We all have specific experiences and backgrounds and education um, that inform how we view the world and not shying away from that and not trying to be the norm or everyone else. Mm -hmm. That's how you really stand out and you, you build that voice so that you can communicate. 
Absolutely beautifully put. And I, I just kind of want to highlight one of the wonderful things here, which is that you know, we don't always necessarily choose the path we're on, but when we're on the path, we can choose where we go with that. And so I think that you've made, some, made a wonderful choice in, in communicating more about tech from being a writer. Thank you. I want to ask a little bit about writing. So um, I, yeah. I worked with a, a friend who was writing a book, and they were studying book writing, and we were talking about it. And you probably know this quote. You probably know who it's from. Um, so writing a book is an adventure. Uh, at the beginning, it's a toy and an amusement, and it becomes a mistress, and then a master, and then a tyrant. And then just as you are about to be <laughs> reconciled to your servitude, you kill the monster and fling your baby to the public. <laughs> that is so well put. I don't know who. who it's who Winston Churchill. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> he was so good with this. So, uh, ter ter arguably terrible human, but very good with words. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do you relate to that at all? Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, I, um, my editor, <laughs> my so for DevOps for Dummies, I actually I wrote something different in the foreword, and my editor wouldn't let me. <laughs> publish it. But I, I kind of talked about this a little bit because writing a book is torture. I mean, it's it's one of the worst things that you could do to yourself. Totally worth it, right? The outcome. I love having written a book. Um, That's a great accomplishment. And from a career perspective, it brings me negotiating power and it helps me really kind of capture uh, value in different ways. But it, it was torture. I mean, I would just sit there you think writing a book is a logical experience. It's not. It's an emotional experience mm -hmm. because you have to go into the depths of your soul, into the cobwebs and the dark places that you've shoved things and pull it out and then turn it into words and put it on a page. And through that experience, there's no cheerleaders. There, though I do have to say other authors, like Jean Kim was very kind to me throughout, uh, Nicole Forsgren, like there are people who, who had my back and cheer cheerleaded um, from the sidelines. So I appreciated that kind of thing. And Nathan Harvey was my co-curator for 97 Things. Um, he's obviously an amazing human being. So I did have support and they deserve credit. Uh, but it was like this, this just solo experience of staring at this blank page and having it just like ask you what you want to say. And yeah, it was torture. I mean, it was, it's hard. It's very, very hard. It's not something that's easy uh, at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I'll, I'll not relate uh, writing a book to writing software anymore after your description, <laughs> but I, I thought there might be some parallels <laughs> there. Um, mm -hmm. But I will, I will say something. Uh, I'll ask you about method, but then, you know, first I'll, I'll tell a little story, which is that, um, so I, I look at motivation and personal motivation, and I completely know what you're talking about when you're, you're sitting there, you're looking at the blank page, and you're saying, I'm just, I'm empty, or what am I supposed to do? And like, I loved how you described uh, developers solving a problem, because some of the greatest developers and the most productive ones I've known, they seem to spend a lot more time talking and, and not typing than typing, but then when yes. they type, they type really good stuff, right? So there's a lot of yes. this kind of introspection in software as well. But before I ask yes. you about method, um, so one method that came uh, really important to me was uh, I heard a joke, and the joke is we have a new company policy. On Monday, you know, everybody recovers from the weekend. God, we hate Mondays. But on Tuesday, we fully pre expect you to prepare to work. On Wednesday, you work. On Thursday, <laughs> you pat yourself on the back so hard for working so hard on, on, on Wednesday. And then on Friday, everybody prepares for the weekend. And then, oh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, yes, can we do something about these Wednesdays? So this is a method I've used a lot in burnout, and I've talked with a lot of people. Like, if you can't, you deserve to recover. And when you have recovered, yes. at least get your desk ready to work, and then do some work, and then feel good about it and recycle. So do you have a method, Emily, mm -hmm. that when the torturous part of the, the book writing is there or some other part of your life, what's the method that you use to get through it? I um I want to just pause for a moment because you you you've touched on so many different things here and I I want to say one of the things that I struggle with still to some degree is that I can be productive and be doing work be doing my job when I am thinking that I don't have to be actively typing or engaging with my computer to be doing work 
I, I have to think. So much of our work is thinking, mm -hmm. but we never really acknowledge that that is work. Um, and it took me a long time to kind of become semi comfortable with it. And I still have moments where I'm like, oh, I need to be in Slack or whatever. Um, but that's not actually productive. And I think that is part of what leads to burnout. And I was also thinking, you know, I, I've, I've fallen down the TikTok rabbit hole, I'll be honest. I'm one of the, the 100 million Americans that the government's worried about right now. Um, but <laughs> I think when we have expected every little thing to, every little moment to be filled with being productive um, or doing something, like even on weekends, I have trouble or I feel guilty when I'm watching TV. It's like, oh, well, you're not doing, you're not cleaning the, the closet or whatever, the dishes are out. Um, and we don't, we don't schedule rest and our society does not respect rest. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard this great quote the other day. It was, you're not lazy. You have a limited amount of energy and right now you're spending it all to survive. And I loved that yes. because I think we, especially since COVID, like we, we have gone through so many um, communal, deep, deep traumatic experiences, yes. right? On various levels. But there has been a lot of just of this, this societal trauma that we just didn't acknowledge, right? Mm -hmm. We did two years of isolation and this strange feeling of like, what if I get it? And then there was this weird emotional guilt when I finally got COVID where it's like, what did I do wrong? I, I'm this horrible person. And so we've layered all these things on top of something and it's, it only goes to torture us. Like all it does is allow us to feel like we should constantly be doing something that we feel guilty when we're not um, productive. Uh, and I think it's harming us. I mean, I think a lot of us are closer to burnout than we probably acknowledge. Um, I'm always like skidding right on burnout. Um, and I also wanna say, once you hit burnout, it's not a quick recovery. Like. You, you think, oh, I'll take a long vacation. No, you're looking at two years of, of systematic, like repairing your adrenals, reducing your cortisol. There are physiological mm -hmm. aspects of this um, that we don't actually kind of talk about because it's just work harder, do more, make more money, get a promotion. Um, it's exhausting. It's just exhausting. So I'll just put this self-compassion is a really, yes. really important thing in this industry, knowing where you are over your limit and being able to back up a little bit before you get into that state. It's so difficult and people expect so much. The, we were just moving, I, I mentioned you, I wanted to ask, I don't have any farm animals yet, but we were just moving <laughs> and we had a, a small crew on the move out and I hurt my arms and so I said on the, on the, on the move uh, into the house, I want to have a, a big crew, send all the guys you've got and they're like, great. And then I'm like, hey, look, there's a light box. I'm going to take that. And then one of the old guys was like, yeah, the young guys can never do that. They always want the heaviest ones. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because you want to prove. Yeah, our egos get on our own way, actually, more than yeah. they help us. Yeah. So do you have a method for, we can, I can split it a little bit now. Like, do you, yeah. do you, do you detect when you're over the limit and know when to stop? <laughs> I'm actually pretty terrible at this. I'll be yeah. honest. I, um, so I find that anyone who's had like an, I'm not convinced that anyone's had an easy path in life, but I like to imagine that there's this, this fictional person who lived in this perfect like fairy tale of a life and, and didn't have, you know, trauma. And I also think, you know, when we talk about things like this, there's no way to compare, you know, it's like pain. You can't, you can't say like if someone's, my daughter's the best example of this. When she gets a shot, that is her level 10 pain and trauma, right? Like she, she hates that so much because that's the worst thing she's experienced. Mine has been upgraded to childbirth. Um, but, <laughs> you know, we, we can't compare those experiences. And so this is another thing that gets in the way of communication when we, we try and say that, like, well, that's not, I, it's the, my friend calls it the, the uh, oppression Olympics or the compassion Olympics. It's like, you're trying to prove that you've gone through something more. That said, I think that when you have gone through tough times and when you have come out of that and, and clawed your way out 
and found success or found found a way to overcome whatever whatever that was you adhere to that that thing that got you out of it and for me like you know my issue when i came out of it like my career got me out of that and so mm -hmm. i i adhere a lot of my ego my self-worth to this and i really struggle to take my foot off the pedal even though i i know i need to because i'm scared right yeah. i'm scared that if i take my foot off the pedal it all it all disappear and I, I won't have any value and no one will like me and like these are really deep things but i think we all experience them um and so one you know <laughs> not being good at it but listening so my mother's always on like Sh did you drink water today did you eat lunch today? <laughs> Did you sleep? Like she's still mothering me. Um, and listening to that, you know, listening to friends who are like, Hey, I think you're, you're struggling or, Hey, you need to slow down. Or I see you continuously put things on your plate and not take them off. Listen to those people in, in your life who want to see you succeed, who, who believe in you, who love you. Um, they will help guide you if you can't see it, you know? So that's, that's the thing I kind of put in place and then schedule rest. I think I, um, like I take Fridays really easily. My my role, my organization, we have no meeting Fridays. That really helps. So if I have to catch up on something awesome, but I'll leave early and I'll go see a movie or whatever I need to do to get over the stress of the week. Uh, and that, you know, not everyone can do that. That's a super privilege. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can schedule that rest, however you can accomplish it, it helps. Yep. Excellent, excellent. I'll try a little different topic. Um, one of the things that we noticed when we put together the host program was that we had representatives from large and small companies. And I know in your profile that you have worked with everything from startups to large technology providers. So would you like to talk a little bit about similarities and differences between startups and large tech or maybe how we could cross pollinate a little more? Yes. Yes, I wrote um, a full, uh, talk on this called Scaling Sparta. Um, but I, I like to think these in three stages. So you have that sort of early stage, it's infancy. Um, you're really just kind of creating something from nothing. And then you have this medium sized company and <laughs> that, that definition can range depending on where you're at. Um, like the, the definition of a medium sized company at a large cloud provider is radically different than a medium sized company if you're a startup. Um, but it's this sort of teenage years where you're starting, you have that product market fit um, and you're really starting to create internal processes that allow you to scale. This is, this is like my least favorite stage of a company. Some people thrive in this ability. They're really good at creating process. Um, I'm not, and so I don't do well in this stage. But then there are the large enterprises. And this is where risk is not a good thing. Whereas startups, like you wanna, you wanna push the envelope. You wanna take risks, because that's how you, you actually make a statement and you, you announce yourself in the market. For a big company, loss is scary. <laughs> the worst thing you can do is mess up. Um, and so their decision making is a lot slower. The processes are a lot more intense. Um, and so there's all these sort of gates to make sure a mistake doesn't happen um, because you can't just shoot from the hip and do whatever you want. So those are, that's sort of how I kind of define things, at least in my head. Um, and there are differences. I mean, in the best possible case, you have large companies who act like a collection of startups. Um, and they, they have that sort of controlled risk. I think risk is something we can't avoid. And I think when you try and avoid risk, you just slowly die. Like there's, you're not pushing the envelope. You're not being inventive. You're not trying new things. Um, but the risk has to be contained. So it's, it's not about never doing risk or never, you know, making risky decisions, but it's about making sure that blast radius is relatively small. Um, so that's the best case scenario. And then the worst case scenario for the big enterprises, like you're just inundated with slow, steady processes and, and that will um, eat away at not just the productivity of a developer, but that joy, right? If you're, if you're trying to actually do things and get to the things that you're excited about and have impact on the end customer, you don't want to be messing with all these kind of requirements and that, that audit and governance you were talking about in the previous talk. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, maybe this, this might be the last one, but let's kind of wrap those a little bit together. So um, you said a lot of points um, that kind of 
work towards, uh, we, we have some CEOs and CTOs in our audience today, so we yes. thanked everybody in the morning for, you know, bring your boss along to a, co to a yes. conference like this. Um, can, we, can you help us to a little bit concisely explain the ROI on developer experience for the C-suite? Absolutely. So developers are almost always any tech company's most expensive spend. Um, your team, just from salaries and uh, workload and everything, that is, it's an, a, a very expensive budget line. Um, worth it. Don't, don't do anything about it. <laughs> but, but making that, that more productive is, is what's key here. And so for when I talk to executives, you know, they're, they're a little bit further removed from the keyboard. So that, that makes sense. Like they're not going to understand the sort of intricacies and they don't need to, right. They have to talk about the strategy and the big picture. Um, we need them to have that, that big view, but for them, it's really about making sure. And when you go in, if, if you're not an executive yet, I would love to see more developers enter the C-suite. Um, but when you communicate with your executives, making sure that they understand the big picture and making sure that they understand that developer experience from an external standpoint you're going to earn loyalty in the market and developers when they have loyalty they are very loyal um you see this like when people invest in early language communities i always recommend like rust is a great example of this rust is not um a universally you know accepted production language yet but it's very exciting and the people who are involved in rust are the people who are going to be the CTOs in the next five, 10, 15 years. And so you want to make sure that you're investing not only in the language, but in those people, because they're going to be making those purchasing decisions over the long term. And so developer experience, it is a longer term investment. It's not something that you're gonna earn um, dividend, dividends from immediately, but that is where you start to see this sort of separation between people who really invest in things. Like you see it right now with Microsoft. They made a lot of really strong bets and they spent a lot of money investing in companies like GitHub, like, um, you know, an N NPM and, you know, now OpenAI. And so you're seeing this sort of separation between people who invest in developers and the developer response to that is, is excitement, it's loyalty, it's happiness, and it's a desire to, to trust and a willingness to try new things from those people who make those investments. So yeah, it's, it's absolutely good business to be investing in developer experience. Excellent. We actually have one more minute on the schedule. Um, there was one question um, that I think was a bit interesting and in this context. Uh, what do you think about uh, like six hour working days and four day working weeks and two months without any work or any of those kinds of systems? <laughs> um, I, so I've always seen the, you know, I'm American, I, I live in the States and it's so interesting to me, the Delta between Europe and personal time and America and personal time. Um, and so, you know, here it's, you're out of offices. I I've run to the dentist for a root canal. I'll be back. I, it's just a minute. Like, it's like this panic of, I, I promise I'm here. I'm working. It's fine. Um, and in Europe, especially France, uh, you know, it's like, no, I'm off for six, six weeks. Goodbye. <laughs> there's like, there's no checking email. There's no way to contact me. Um, I'm gone. I'll see you later. And I love that. I really, really um, admire the European approach to this. I think it's more sustainable for the humans involved. Um, and I, I hope that we get to that point here. Um, but I, I love it. I think the science behind it seems sound, right? That people are more productive when they work fewer hours. And it, it's because you're not filling time. This concept of the 40 hour work week, which is actually better than the Victorian start of it um <laughs> it's been a reduction but when you force people into this catch all time frame you're not tailoring it to certainly not that person and how they work certainly not the type of work they do like i said i've done some of my best thinking while out in the yard staring at a tree or um exercising or whatever else when thinking is work the work hours don't really impact that. And so all you're doing is forcing them to fill time. Um, and that's done through Slack messages or whatever else, or just staring at the computer or being miserable. Um, so you don't want that last one. Um, I, I love the idea of shortening the work week and making sure that people 
when they're working, they're productive. And when they're off, they're resting because it, it makes them better workers in the long term uh, and certainly more productive. Awesome. Yeah, I think it was Einstein that said the bed, the bath, and the bus. That's where the good ideas come. Yes. So. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Thank you so much, Emily. This has been Thank fantastic. You. It's been wonderful. And I feel like we shared a safe space here together across the yes. wire and across the conference. And that was, that was really, really wonderful to share this time with you. Thank you, Emily Thank Freeman, you. ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Hi, we're from Epico, the proud organizer of the DevOps conference. Our goal is to uncover cutting edge talks, emerging ideas, and DevOps trends, providing a global forum for practitioners and decision makers to learn and grow. We would love to also explore how we can help you excel in DevOps together. Visit us at effico.com and enjoy the inspiring talks at the DevOps conference.